They are some of the bravest men in sports, yet some call them just crazy to sit on 1,800 pounds of muscle and get flung around like a rag doll for 8 seconds. Yes, I'm talking about a bull rider. My guest today will tell us about his experiences growing up in bull riding as one of the few black professional cowboys in rodeo, how he became a rodeo announcer, and how his love for chocolate chip cookies has led him down a new career path as a baker. Next, on Sports in the Making. Thank you once again for joining me on Sports in the Making, a podcast where we find out about what people in the sports and sports broadcasting industry do, how they've made an impact in the sports world, and how it all comes together. I'm your host, Don Cardona, and this is episode number 23. If you've never been to a rodeo, you're missing out on one of the oldest sports in history. If you have, you know there are many sports that can cause injury in what's called the rough stock events. Saddle bronc riding, bareback bronc riding, which are all on horses, and of course, bull riding. It takes a special kind of person to do any of these, but for me, the most dangerous of these is bull riding. I got to know this sport when I worked as a cameraman on a bull riding event in Phoenix early in my TV career, and it gave me a different appreciation for what these cowboys do. I followed it casually over the years, reconnecting with it in 2018 when I began producing a documentary on bull riding, and it led me to this episode's guest, Abe Morris. Abe is one of the few black rodeo cowboys to have ridden bulls professionally. He's done quite a bit within the sport and competed with some of the best bull riders in history in the late 70s and into the 1990s with guys such as Donnie Gay, Tuff Hedeman, and Lane Frost, who was immortalized in the motion picture 8 Seconds. In this episode, we talk about how he started riding bulls as a child in New Jersey, the challenges he faced as a black cowboy, how he became an announcer for Fox Sports, and his latest passion, baking some of the best cookies available. This is my conversation with my most recent friend, Abe Morris. All right, he's a former professional bull rider winning multiple regional championship buckles. He's been a rodeo announcer with Prime Sports Network and Fox Sports. He's the first African-American to get his Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association announcer card. He's been inducted into the National Multicultural Western Heritage Museum and a Hall of Famer in the Salem County, New Jersey Sports Hall of Fame. And if that's not enough, he's an author of a couple of books, which we'll talk about later. And his latest venture is Creating Things in the Kitchen, where he bakes his Cowboy Shootout cookies, which I had the chance to try earlier this year, and they are truly amazing. So... Abe, we're going to talk about all of that in just a bit. But first, what's been happening with you during COVID-19? I still have a job, and I am very, very thankful and very blessed to have a job. I could actually stay home. and But basically, first, our, our, you know, our institution, I work for the VA, Department of Veterans Administration. Um, excuse me, part, Department of Veteran Affair, Veterans Affairs. But anyway, at first they told us we had to stay home, and then they gave us the option that we could still come in. Only a handful chose to came in to come in. About 90% of the people, well, I'll say 95% of the people in my department don't come in at all. But I chose to because I didn't want to sit at home and listen to CNN all day long and listen to the gloom and doom because I knew it would depress me. So I still go to work, and I'm just blessed and thankful that I have a job and an income. For my audience, I, I just want to give a brief explanation on how we met. We met at a, an event called the Castle Rock Bull Riding Challenge back in 2018. I was shooting a documentary, and as I was getting my gear ready, I noticed a bunch of people gathering around this man that had a bunch of clear plastic bags with stuff in them, but I didn't know what it was. And that man was obviously you. So I asked a couple of people uh, who you were and you know, basically who's that guy, and they told me it was you, and you were selling your famous cowboy shootout cookies. Now I have two food weaknesses. One is cinnamon buns. And the other is chocolate chip cookies. So a bit later, I went looking for you because I wanted to buy some, and they were all sold out. When we talked later, you had mentioned that you were an announcer at Fox Sports. So before we get into your career, let's talk a bit about your cookie business. How did you get started with that? Well, when I was a kid, my sister Janice baked chocolate chip cookies on a regular basis. And of course, when she started baking, the whole house, we'd smell them. So we'd come in and for lack of a better term, we'd steal them, and she'd chase us out of the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> so I loved chocolate chip cookies. Those were really good. When I got out of college, 
I still love chocolate chip cookies, and I decided, well, the only you know I didn't have a girlfriend at the time, and I said, well, I'm going to teach myself to bake chocolate chip cookies. That's how much I like them. So, got a recipe, baked some cookies, and I just tweaked it and tweaked it and tweaked it over the years, and that's how I got started baking chocolate chip cookies. Now, your cookies have taken on some sort of fame, I guess I'd say. I mean, you're you're a presence at a lot of rodeos. Uh, including some of the big venues such as the PBR World Finals and I imagine the NFR and things of that nature. How have you been able to get that word out about your cookies? Is it you or is it a combination of just word of mouth? A little bit of both. I've, I've gone to the NFR probably, I don't know, probably the last six or seven years in a row and I always stay at the Orleans and Donnie Gay and Joe Beaver and Dan Miller have a show at the Orleans and it's the, uh, they always do it every night on stage after the National Finals Rodeo performance and a couple of years ago. And Donnie Gay, by the way, absolutely loves my cookies. And a couple of years ago, I asked him, hey, Donnie, could you, you know, hey, if you can get me on your show? And he said, yeah, I'll get you on tonight. <laughs> so I said, tonight? And he's like, yeah. I said, well, don't you need to go ask somebody else first? And he said, no. He said, it's my show, and I'll do whatever I want. So he got me on, and that was in 2017. I mean, excuse me, 2018, December. And so then the next year, I asked him again. He goes, yeah, heck yeah, we'll get you on again. So RFD TV has filmed me on stage, and I just go up and talk about my cookies and talk about my rodeo book and I just hand out little free samples to the audience, and they love them. What's the secret of your cookie, then? You know, I don't really know. I tweaked them over the years, and when I finally got to the recipe that I liked, I stick with it. But uh, as far as, you know, that, I'm really not going to divulge anything. I'm not going to tell anybody exactly what I do. I I finally did write down my recipe, and, uh, and that's about it. But I do the same thing every single time without fail. I don't deviate. I use my recipe. I don't know any bills that has my recipe because people tell me that how unique they are. They said they like them. My cookies are big and they're thick and they're, they're tasty. And I like them too. Don't get me wrong. I, I probably like my chocolate chip cookies as well as anybody. But I have, I mean, I've been inundated and I'm glad that multiple people have told me these are the best chocolate chip cookies they've ever had in their life and i'm glad because that that's a still that's a market for me that i keep pursuing i did try them and they're excellent once COVID opens up again i'll probably be giving you a call okay thank you so um talking about your career you know when we talked a couple months ago how about about how you got into bull riding uh, and for what's known as a western sport you started at eight years old as a kid in new jersey how did that happen I have three, actually four, older cousins. Two of them have passed away, but Gene Walker, David Walker, Jimmy Lee Walker, Willie Ed Walker. My dad sent me to live with them. Their, their mom and my dad are sister and brother. So they're, they're my mom's, I mean, their mom's maiden name is Morris. And he sent me to live with them for the summer before I went to kindergarten. And so the rodeo arena, the Cowtown Rodeo Arena, was only about maximum 150 yards from their house and so anyway they you know everything was being right there it was the rodeo they had a flea market on tuesdays and the rodeo was every saturday night in the summer and i stayed there and they were already riding ponies and horses and stuff like that and so they just basically convinced me to do what they did they were my coaches they looked i looked up to them you know they looked down on me but they would, they you know, they wouldn't let me get on anything they thought would actually hurt me or injure me, and and they just progressed from one thing to another. I started riding calves, and you know, there's not such thing as mutton busting back then, but I started riding calves, and then I started riding junior bulls, and then I sat out a couple of years. I was too small to ride the big bulls, and then when I was age 16, I started riding the big bulls. Hmm. So you came from a rodeo family. How did that influence? what your future was with bull riding. I mean, you went to college, you you left New Jersey to go to the University of Wyoming on an academic and a rodeo scholarship, but where did the turn happen for you? When did you realize that this is truly what you wanted to do? 
Well, it was something I always wanted to do. Once I got into rodeo and I did really well riding junior bulls, and I figured out that I had some talent. And my cousins always coached me and told me how well I rode. And I had one, my oldest, oldest cousin, Gene Walker, he went to the, he went to Casper College on a rodeo scholarship. And because he went to Wyoming, I'm sure that's, that is the reason I went. I just wanted to follow in his footsteps. And I tell people, if he had gone to Texas, I'm pretty sure I'd probably went to Texas. But he went to Wyoming, he came back, he told his stories, he did really well at collegiate rodeos. And after that, that was it. I wanted to go to Wyoming just because he did. Well, in a sport that I, I think most people don't think of, of many black athletes participating in, how were you perceived in rodeo at the time? Um, it was different. It was, you know, for lack of a better term, I was like the only fly in the milk bowl. No doubt about that. Yeah, no doubt. When I showed up at college rodeos, I mean, my cousin was gone. He'd already finished his career and moved on, and eventually he went to Hollywood and started making movies as a stuntman. But I was the only black guy in the Central Rocky Mountain Rodeo region for almost the entire time I was there. I think maybe when I was a senior, two other guys came from Chicago, but for the first three years, it was it. I was it. That was it. So every time we went to college rodeo, I mean, if they saw a black guy at the rodeo competing, they knew it was me, Abe Morris University of Wyoming. So that's how I got started. It was, but you know, when I showed up on campus, I would wear, I wore like t-shirts and things like that that said rodeo because I was a fan. Anything that said rodeo, I wanted to wear it. And one of the football players, one of the black football players saw me wearing a t-shirt said, rodeo, America's number one sport. And he said, what do you know about rodeo? And I told him <laughs> I was a cowboy. And he said, cowboy? I said, I'm a bull rider. He said, bull rider? He said, there's no such thing as black cowboys. So he said, where are you from? I said, New Jersey. Then he laughed. He thought it was a <laughs> joke. Uh, I know you're lying to me because, first of all, there's no such thing as a black cowboy. They don't exist. And you're going to tell me you came from New Jersey and you know, all that? So anyway, I, I told him that come to my dorm room. I said, I'll show you some photos. And he didn't for about, you know, a month. He still wouldn't come to my room. And I would always see him. And I lived in Earl Hall. And I'd say, Nate, come up to my room. I'll show you my photo album. He refused. And the only way I made a connection with him was one day I walked out of the, my room and he was standing there waiting for the elevator. And I said, you know, finally I had him cornered. I said, hold on, because it's been going on for about a month. I said, hold on, hold on. I said, stay right here. He kept, man, I don't have time for you. I got to go to class. I said, stay right here. I ran down to my room, grabbed my photo album, came out here. Look at it. He started turning the pages and cursing up a storm. <laughs> no, I mean, cursing. Blankety, blank, blankety, blank. He said, I got to show the other guys this photo album. He took off. He went and started knocking on doors and stuff like that. And I'm like, where are you going? Give me back my album. Oh, no, he wouldn't give it back. He was a big guy. And he just said, I got to show so-and-so these books, these pictures. And next thing you know, he went, you know, he's a football player, so he told the whole, you know, football team, man, there's a little skinny black guy in Orha. He rides some great big bulls. And it spread like wildfire. Did they come out and, and, and watch you bull ride? And if they did, what was their reaction then? Well, at the time, we would practice at the OK Corral. It was a high plains arena in the OK Corral. Pete Burns owned it. Hal Burns owned it. And the rodeo team would actually pay for us to go practice. They had bulls, and we'd go out and get on the bulls, and they'd charge all our fees. You know, the rodeo team paid for the, um, the practice session. So we got on for free, but they charged the college, the university, the rodeo team. And so that way, yeah, but a couple guys came out, and they just wanted to see me in person. So they did. And in fact, I remember when they came out, and it, it was all by draw. And I actually, they had this bull. He was, uh, I can't think of his name. I'll think of it eventually. But he was, oh, they called him Goliath. And he was huge compared to the other bulls. He was. He was the absolute biggest bull. And he stood out just like a Goliath. And that's why they called him Goliath. And I went out and I drew that bull, and they thought it was all rigged. They said, man, we went to watch Jerry Bride, and they put him on the biggest bull out there. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, after that, this guy, he lived on my floor, and he was an English major, 
His name was Jeff Fry, and he told me, the only people that knew I was on the rodeo team or Road Bulls were the people who, close contact, you know, they saw me leave, they'd see me leaving the dorm with my bag and, you know, my, my gear and all that stuff. I didn't have a hot, you know, a buckle at the time or anything like that, but they, they, they noticed, they, hey, this guy going to practice and all that. That's the only time I looked like a cowboy was when I went to practice. And, uh, he said, Hey, I know you ride bulls. And he said, I want to do a story. Well, his, his assignment for that semester was to write a story on an interesting student at the University of Wyoming, and that was his assignment for his English major. And he said, I know you're a cowboy, I know you ride bulls. He said, I want to write my story on you. Would you agree? And I said, sure. So he wrote this story on me, and, you know, I, I tell people it's the truth. He, he polished it up. You know, I said he added a little more salt and pepper to the story, and he tried to make me look like this great bull rider. It wasn't true, because I really hadn't done anything. <laughs> And and people were like, oh man, who's this guy? So anyway, they what they did is they purposely coordinated the story to go with the college rodeo. The college rodeo was right there on campus. That's where they played basketball in the field house, and they had track events in the field house, and things of that nature. And the football team practiced in the field house. Well, they would just go in, move the seats back, put in a whole bunch of dirt, bring in bucket shoots and stuff, and we had a college rodeo. So. The story came out on a Thursday. The college rodeo started on Friday. It was just a a great, you know, it was just a real good publicity stunt, you know, to get people to see that there was this black cowboy and just talk about the rodeo. And anyway, well, the students, once they saw the article, then they were, some of them knew who I was, but a lot of people, they had no idea that I even existed. So they were like, yeah, we're going to go watch this guy ride. And so it just so happened Friday night, I had the ride. And I, re- I still remember the story very vividly because I, I felt like I was just under a microscope because all these people were trying to figure out, oh, I've never seen this black guy. Who is this? You know, the dorm people knew who I was and they were all telling me, oh man, that was a great story. And I remember going to the library that night to try to hide. It just, you know, just to hide, because I had studied for this test. And these students, and there were papers everywhere, all over the place. You know, I see the paper that came out, you know, five days a week. It was called the Branding Iron. And these guys, they kept staring at me. And I was trying to be, you know, incognito. And I still, I could see them out of the corner of my eye, but I wouldn't look at them. And they kept looking at the paper, and they'd look at me. And they'd look at the paper, and they'd look at me. And after a while, they'd point it. That's him right over there. I couldn't even go to the library and hide. They spotted me. <laughs> so you were somewhat of a celebrity in college based on this one article that was written about you. Exactly, because the next night, I came downstairs. I was all ready. My sister, she was a seamstress, seamstress and she made polyester shirts. I called them silk. You know, back then, you know, these were the disco shirts. And I always, she made me several of those shirts. And I came down off the elevator. I had my gear, my hat, and everything. And I had to walk over to the field house. And I had a couple friends with me. And I stepped off the elevator, and the dorm, the lobby was full. And I mean full of all these black football players. Well, football players, period, but mostly the black ones hung out in Nora Hall. They saw me step off the elevator and they start whooping and yelling and, <laughs> hey, 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 we going to ride, you know, do it up. They said, we're coming over to watch you tonight. I was scared. I, I'm like, the bull I had already bucked me off the previous fall. This was in March. So I knew the bull was a good bull. He bucked hard. And uh, they said, oh, yeah, 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 we're going to come watch you ride. Blah, blah. So I was getting ready to walk over. I was nervous. I was scared. And this one student piped up, and she goes, hey, hey, Morris, just because you had a big article in the newspaper, now you think you're some kind of celebrity. And I, oh, she said, now you think you're some kind of superstar, don't you? I'm like, superstar? Man, I didn't, I didn't expect that kind of publicity. I was scared. And so I didn't know what to say to her. You know, she's like, all the publicity's going to my head. So what I did is I was getting ready. You know, I'm real quick on my feet. And I was getting ready to walk out the door because she was cutting me down. I took my hat off and I tipped it to her. 
And I, you know, I don't, I want to let her know this publicity is not going to my head. And I told her, I said, my cowboy hat still fits. <laughs> and I put it on my head and they all cheered me. Yeah. Good comeback. And I walked over to the field house and two days later I was the bull riding champion. That that's interesting. And I, I did not know that part of the story. Uh, so what was your experience being the only black bull rider on the professional circuit at that time? It was different. You know, when I first came out west, basically, I came from New Jersey. I went to Cheyenne Frontier Days Rodeo, and I wanted to be accepted. I mean, no doubt. I wanted my peers to accept me. Who not? I looked up to these guys for years. And then to see them in person, you know, I'd read about them in the rodeo sports news, the pro rodeo sports news, but I didn't have a clue who they were. But when I saw them, of course, I knew who they were. But it was different. I, You know, I wanted to be accepted. But at the same time, I I told myself I was going to let my talent speak for itself. You know, I didn't want I wasn't going to go up to him and warm up to him, and you know, I wasn't going to bow down to him or you know anything like that. I was determined that if they're going to accept me, they're going to accept me based on my talent and nothing else. And you know, and over the years, they they accepted me. They saw I was a talented bull rider, and I tried as hard as they did, and. You know, the camaraderie was definitely there. So, you know, and I would, I'll would i say this right now. I, I never really experienced any racism or anything like that from the bull riders. You know, to me, it was always, you know, the word we used back then was prejudice. But uh, sure. some of those judges were, and I, I'm never going to say they weren't. They would... You know, they would dock you points and stuff like that. And, you know, and I, I mean, when you make a good ride, you know it. You know, the crowd's cheering and yelling and you step off and you, you do whatever you need to do. You throw your hands in the air and then they score you and the crowd starts booing the score. You know something's wrong. And that happened to me several times in my career where I get off and I was excited. Like, yeah, I'm going to win a bunch of money. And then they'd bounce my score. And then the crowd would just blew their heads off because they knew. They knew it. And now, just to be clear, this whole time period for you as a writer and, and being in college was, I'd say, mid-70s to mid-80s, right in that range? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, early 80s to be exact. Cause I, started in, I started in 74, and then I graduated. I sat out a year, and then I graduated in May 1980, and that was after sitting out a year and changing my major. So it actually, it took me five years to graduate when, you know, sometimes it takes most people four. But I was, I changed my major, I lost a lot of credit. So it was kind of like starting over again. So the judges you're referring to, I would imagine maybe they might have been a little older and, and you know, grew up in a different type of era. Is that, do you feel like that had anything to, to play a part of as how they judged? Yeah. Without a doubt, because most of the judges, like now it's different. They have a, you know, the PRCA, the Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association, they have a, a set team of judges, and you have to go to seminars and stuff like that, and, and they're pretty consistent. They are. They're a lot different compared to what, what it was when I came on the scene. They had old school, I'm going to say redneck judges, and, you know, they weren't necessarily, they didn't see very many cowboys, you know, they didn't see very many black bull riders, and, and they still held on to their old selfish ways, or their old prejudicial ways, or whatever you want to call it, so, and, I mean, who was going to do, there was nothing I could do to the judges to make them give me more points, I mean, I could spur bull, I could ride him well, or anything like that, and I'm not saying it happened all the time, because sometimes I got what I deserved, but, you know, it seems like a lot of times, though, you know, when you when you get, you know, I don't know, when you get worked over, I'm going to say, they stick out. And then there were times, and that was part of the reason I didn't, I didn't, we could, rodeo, you have to win to stay out on the road. It's a very, very tough and competitive environment. And there were times I'd go to some of the big rodeos, and when I should have won more money, that would keep me on the road. It didn't happen. And there was no such thing as sponsors back in the day. you know. So I never did go to the National Finals Rodeo as a contestant, but it wasn't because of my talent, because I had a world champion bull rider, Gary LeFew, who's called, most people call him the guru. He told me one year, he said, he said, man, he said, you ride well. He told me I rode as well as the middle 
of the 15 guys that go to the finals every year. And he said, the only reason why I hadn't gone to the finals is because I didn't go to enough rodeos. You have to go to a lot of rodeos to win a lot of money. And he told me at the same time, he said, I guarantee you, if you go to a lot of rodeos next year, he said, I guarantee you, at the end of the year, you're going to be at the national finals. That's how good you are. Wow. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's the the sports changed quite a bit, and I've come familiar with it because I am shooting a documentary on bull riding. Hopefully, I'll have completed at least by September, October. Um, but you mentioned Don Gay earlier, and then Gary Lafue, two of some of the best bull riders in history. Were those the guys that you kind of looked to for guidance and things like that? I, I mean, and those are just more the traditional types of names, but. You know, in my research, you know, I discovered Murtis Deitman, who's in the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame, known as the Jackie Robinson of rodeo and the first African-American to compete in the national finals rodeo. And then you've got Charlie Simpson, who I believe was maybe a little bit after you, the first PRCA world champion in 1982 and also a Pro Rodeo Hall of Famer. How did those guys factor into the way you were as a writer? Well, you know, Charlie... Uh, Samson was out at the same time I was. So I met Charlie before he ever qualified for the National Finals Rodeo. Okay. So, yeah, I met him at a rodeo in Evanston, Wyoming. I didn't know who he was. I had no clue who he was. But I watched him, and and, and I'm like, wow, that guy rides pretty good. And I think it, it was probably about three years later that he became a world champion. Maybe, maybe I don't know, three to four years later, because he was a world champion in 1982. But when I came out, Murtis Dightman had already retired, so he didn't really you know, affect my career at all. Now, he was around when my cousin Gene Walker was around, and I knew a lot about Murtis Dightman before I came out west, because, you know, of course, you know, being a black cowboy and here, there's this famous black bull rider out west, well... I always wanted to go out west, and I knew a lot about Murtis, and I always looked up to him, but I, I never met Murtis Dightman until his career was over. I was still competing, but I think I met him in Houston one year. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't say that would really affect me. I mean, I can say, you know, they encouraged me. I'm glad they were out there, but, you right. know, rodeos, uh, you know, it's a, it's a personal sport, and it's what you do when you get on a bull that, you know, the judges judge you, the crowd cheers, and all that stuff. So, you know, when I climbed down on the bull, I didn't think a lot about Charles Sampson or Murdoch Dightman. I was thinking about Abe Morris trying to <laughs> win some money and make the whistle and stay alive. What's the relationship building like when you're a bull rider? Because you're going from small town to small town and, you know, different states. And do you travel alone? Did you travel together with a group of guys? How did that work? Yeah, the PRCA set up what was called a buddy system which was done through PROCOM, where you entered the central entry office, where it guaranteed that you would be, and, you know, you would be competing at the same exact time as your traveling partner. So that helped a lot. So at one point, I think it was like groups of two, for sure, would always be in the same performance or slack. Or, I think you could enter as much as three guys, not four. And all four guys would, you know, be in the same performance, but guys would try to split them up because, you know, if they were going to make sure they had four guys in the same performance, but there was only three places left to be in the performance, then they would put all four guys in the slack. And the slack was like the extra, and they never put any decent bulls in the slack because they wanted their best bulls to be seen by the audience, by the crowd. So the best bulls got bucked on the performance. The dinks got bucked in the slack. Most of the time when guys drew up in the slack, they'd turn out. They would call Procom, tell them they weren't coming, they'd pay their entry fee, and they'd go to another rodeo because your chances were slim or none. Slim to none that you were going to win any money. I don't think hardly anybody ever won money in the slack in the PRCA. So, but that was where, yeah, but you had that buddy system that helped a lot. So, yeah, you would travel with the same guys and usually, you know, you get three or four guys together and you take one vehicle and, you know, you'd split expenses, you know, we'd split, you know, gas and expenses and things like that. So that helped a lot. And because these were the guys that, you know, you were the guys that you were closest to anyway. So you would pick a partner usually and travel with them you'd, sometimes for the whole season. I'm sure you've, you developed some really close friendships out of that. I did. I mean, lasting friendships and, I mean, these are guys that I still see, you know, 
they don't compete anymore, but we keep in touch, mostly on Facebook or something like that. But yeah, these are the, the relationships that you've gained over the years. And I mean, there is a, there is a camaraderie with the bull riders. I mean, to, I'm going to think about it. It's a very, very dangerous sport and guys get killed and, you know, it's, yeah, it's, dang. I mean, I was at Cheyenne. I was actually working for Prime Sports and I interviewed Lane Frost the, the day he got killed and as an announcer. And yeah, I cried like a little baby. It was tough. We'll get to that in just a little bit because I'm curious to find out more. Before we move on, um, what does wearing a buckle mean to a bull rider? It's a status symbol. It's just like people, you know, when you, 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 you know, you're in a parking lot or something you, or an event or something, you see somebody drive up in a Mercedes or something of that nature, a Cadillac or a really nice car, you know, now it's, it's you know, Lexus or, you know, things of that nature, a Tesla or, a, you know, a Jaguar or something. You're like, whoa, it's a status symbol. And people, we're all humans. We pay attention to status symbols. Yeah. And so you go to a rodeo and you would meet people or, you know, even women, they call them, some guys call them buckle bunnies. You know, these are women that went and <laughs> they were just fans, but you know, the nicer buckle you wore, the more prestigious you were. And they would pay more attention to the guys with a nice buckle. They're like, Oh wow. Because it's a, it's a, it just shows a, it's like a testament to your talent. Yeah. You know, if you wear a really, really nice buckle, like, wow, that guy must be good. Look at that buckle he wears. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's what, it's just true. That's human nature. But I'll tell you this, too. I mean, I, I've gone to rodeos all over the United States, and I don't care who they are. They might meet you, or they, or they shake your hand, or a fan, or something like that. They will shake your hand, and I guarantee you, they look at your buckle at the same time. They, they're trying to be <laughs> suave about it. But they look, they glance at your buckle. They want to, oh, wow, you know, the first thing, oh, this, this guy's something. Look at the buckle. But now, I don't know, there's, there's so many buckles now. You really, they aren't as prestigious as they sure. used to be because, you know, back when I was going, only certain rodeos gave out buckles and, you know, it was like that. But now you have people that, they get buckles out for first place and second place and third place and fourth place. There's buckles all over the place. But yeah. back when I was going, if you didn't win first, you didn't win a buckle. And most rodeos didn't give away buckles. Right. Well, and you, I mean, you were pretty good at, for your time. And I'll just read off a little bit of your accomplishments here. You were an eight-time qualifier in the Mountain State Circuit Finals and the average winner in 1989. The 1989 Wrangler Circuit Series Bull Riding Champion two-time qualifier for the Dodge National Circuit Finals Rodeo, the 1990 Open to the World Bull Riding Champion, and you toured with the Bull Riders Only Series for three years. And, you know, you mentioned all the buckles that they're giving out now. I think maybe that's a sign that, you know, there there's more opportunity as well for, for riders to earn money and, and to get a little bit of that stuff. You know, and, and just looking at, again, from some of my research, um, you know, writers today in the PBR who are black, Ezekiel Mitchell, I'm not sure how much you follow of them, but he was ranked number one in the PBR last September 2019. What do you think the future is for black cowboys in, in the sport? It's, that's a tough one because I, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that there isn't more black radio contestants out there. There are some, and don't get me wrong. If you go to Texas, you go to Oklahoma, yeah, there are a lot of black cowboys, but they don't go to the, the PRCA. You know, they might go to the Bill Pickett Association, which is a, you know, it's a smaller association. They only put on about maybe 10 rodeos a year mm. or something like that. If they go to like Cleo Hearns, Cowboys of Color, you'll see some there, but, and even in the PBR, there's only, you know, like a handful, like, yeah, Ezekiel Mitchell, but if you go back to the P, the PBR, there's only been a few black guys that have actually qualified for the PBR finals. And I think, I can name them all, but I know Nick Buckley was one of the guys. And you think, uh, Gary Richard, I'm not sure if he ever qualified. I can't remember. But uh, I think he did. Gary Richard did, Nick Buckley. Um, is there a reason you think why they're not, or is it just there's no interest in it? I said there's a lot of interest, but I don't really know. I remember when I retired, I did a, a radio interview long ago, and uh, 
and actually it was I was at a I was at a studio here in Denver, and Lee Aiken was at a studio in New York City at the time of one of the events, and we we did a you know a radio interview, and they aired it, and I said. I thought, and I'd already been retired for at least 10 years or more, maybe more. I said, I thought there'd be a lot more black cowboys out there. And Lee disputed me. He said, there were. And I really, looking back, I, I dispute that. There was only a handful back then. And I mean, even if you go to the, to the NFR, the Wrangler National Finals Rodeo, Mike Moore was the last bull rider to qualify for the National Finals Rodeo. And I think that was 2003, 2004 right around in there, so it's been about a 15-year time frame where you haven't even had a black bull rider to qualify for the National Finals Rodeo, and I think there's been about five guys that have gone, Charlie Sampson, Urban Williams, Brian Riley, Mike Moore, I can't think of his name right now, I'm missing one person, I can't, I'll think of him, but That's yeah, okay. I, but I thought there would be a heck of a lot more black boys in the PBR, in the PRCA, and all on all, but I mean, there are a few coming out now that are doing well. Like I'll give you an example, uh, Sylvester Mayfield. His son Shad is winning the tie down open by a long shot right now. He sh- he'll probably be the world champion. Mm. So there, you know, there is some representation, but not as much as I thought. You know, twenty years after I retired, so I'm kind of disappointed. But I'm a fan. I'm always going to be a bull riding fan. I'm always going to be a rodeo fan. Sure. I just wish there were more black cowboys out there. And I'll say this too: I still look forward to the day when I see a black black woman qualify for the national finals rodeo on the barrel racing event. I'm talking with Abe Morris, one of the few professional black bull riders, an announcer, an author, and a cookie baker. Now, we, I mentioned at the top of the show that uh, you're the first African-American to get your PRCA announcer card, um, and that led to you becoming an announcer covering rodeo for Prime Sports Network and Fox Sports, including the Cheyenne Frontier days for nearly a decade. How did you get into broadcasting? I lived in Laramie, and actually, I think I, think I got my card about 1982, is when I got it. 82, 83, I think, is when I got my card, if I remember correctly. I was living in Laramie, and, and Pete Burns was putting on a weekly rodeo, and somehow I got bamboozled into becoming the announcer, and I announced it for a couple summers, and then Pete Burns was going to get his PRCA announce, you know, his PRCA contractor's card, but he told me, hey, you can't be a... I want you to continue announcing my weekly rodeos, but you're going to have to get your your pro card to do that. So I did a petition and got a bunch of guys to sign a letter for me. And, you know, I told them what I'd done. I'd been announcing this rodeo for a couple summers and, and they signed for me and all that. And then I sent the letter in to the PRCA and Bob Tomlin was actually the, the contestant director at the time, personnel director for, you know, person, people like myself and Bob Tallman actually, you know, he saw the letter and all that and saw what I had and all these multiple signatures, and he approved my card. So I became the first black announcer in the PRCA, and that was about 37 years ago. And I'll tell you this, I always thought there'd be more, but 37, 38 years later, there's only two of us now. Yeah. My thoughts and a guy named Marcus Friday out of Oklahoma. There's only two black announcers in the PRCA, the Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association. When you did work with Prime Sports and Fox Sports, uh, what did you do? How did you call your events? Um, basically, they were they were voiced over, and I didn't know a lot about it. But they called me. Prime called me up and said, "Hey, we're going to be at Shine Frontier Days and on and on, and we need a commentator." And we, you know, we know they they knew who I was because I had actually done an interview with them the previous year at Cheyenne. They said we need a commentator. And we know you have your announcer's card, and you know you you've done well. You speak well on camera. We'd like to have you be our announcer. And I'm like, really? Yeah. And I said, well, I said I've never had any television experience. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. If you want to have me, I'm all for it. So I did it. And after I did the show, that was in '89. That was when Lane got killed. And then uh, they told me they said you're. 
you know, we like you and all that stuff. And they basically told me, the guys at Pine Sports told me, they said, as long as we have a contract to do Cheyenne Frontier Days, you're going to be our guy. And I did it for like the next eight or nine years as a TV commentator. Wow. Yeah. And, and you'd mentioned earlier some of the guys that you rode with, um, you know, a lot of well-known cowboys, um, in, including some of the guys that I'm going to mention here. And I'm just naming a few. And, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but guys like Tuff Hedeman, Ty Murray, Gary LaFew, Cody Custer, is was he one of them as well? Yes, no doubt. Uh, you know, all these, most of these guys are, are great. And then one that, you know, I'm sure many people know about, and you mentioned him earlier, Lane Frost, who was immortalized in the Hollywood motion picture Eight Seconds and portrayed by the late Luke Perry. Uh, how do you think that mo- movie captured who Lane Frost was? It, it was, you know, it was a Hollywood movie. I think there's some things in there weren't true, but most of it, you know, I mean, it didn't attract an audience. Like, part of the thing was they had that Lane and his dad didn't get along, and that was just that was just Hollywood stuff. Yeah. But uh, they got along really well. In fact, every year I go to the National Finals Rodeo, I see I, I see uh, Elsie and Clyde Foss, and we always make a, a point to take a picture together. Like when I started going and my son Justin would go with, go with me, we'd always make sure we took a picture. And one of those pictures is posted on my website. And I didn't really even have to tell people who they were. I'm sure most people, all you do is look at the picture. You know, it's me, you know, it's Justin, you know, it's Clyde Foss, you know, it's Elsie Foss. So anyway, but yeah, it, it, you know, I don't, I don't, I, it's, I don't know. It's uh I came along at a great time. I those guys were great. They were always super nice to me, and I just feel I feel blessed that I got to know some of those guys on a personal level. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it's not like I have to go tell somebody, "Hey, I know Tough Heatman." He knows me. If I see him and we're going to speak, we're going to shake hands. We're not bosom buddies. I can tell you that, but we're we're going to always be cordial to each other and. You know, that goes where everything is a lot of them I'm a lot more cordial with than I am with Tough Heathen, but that's not a that's not a knock on him. I'm just saying sure. but you know, all those guys I know them really well and they know me really well. So it's it's a camaraderie. It's not it's not like I mean if you go up to Ty Mary and say, Hey, and you ever hear of Abe Morris, he, he was gonna, he's probably gonna laugh at you. Like, of course I know him. <laughs> you know, it's it's cool. With Lane Frost, you'd mentioned that you had interviewed him on the day that that he died. Do you remember the conversation you had prior to that happening and then your reaction after? Well, yeah, when I, well, I get there, I'm at Cheyenne, and and I didn't have to introduce myself because everybody knew who I was already, so I would just go grab them. Hey, you guys, I'm working on a TV station. You mind if I interview you? And every single one of them said yes. They told me, pick about 10 guys to interview before the rodeo who have already done well and who have a good chance to do well. So I just randomly grabbed people who had already done well, because Lane won the second go-around at Cheyenne that year. And uh, he was in the finals, and I just grabbed a couple guys, and I would interview them, interview them. And I was on camera, and so basically I would, you know, I'd stand, and they told us to interview some guys. If we need the footage, we'll use it. If not, don't worry about it. At least we got some extra footage. And so I just would grab guys and interview them on camera, and I'd say, you know, I'd ask them questions and da 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 da, back and forth, back and forth. And because I was on camera, I shook every one of them. I shook their hand. You know, I said, here, well, good luck today. And then when I interviewed Lane, you know, I basically, hey, okay, you won the second round, that or you know, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, what are your chances? What do you think of the bull you have today? Stuff like that. And he had the bull so was the Bulls brand, but his, his, his name was uh, Bat to the Bone, was they called him, or something like that. And uh, the, because the, you know, the Bull Riders called him SO. But anyway, we just talked back and forth, and I shook his hand, and I said, good luck. And then after I watched him ride and everything, and he died, I didn't know he died right then and there. I didn't know it till about probably half an hour later was when I really, really knew he had passed away. But I cried. I broke down cried like a little baby. It was hard because then I looked back and I said, you know, when I when I shook Lane's hand and said good luck, I was really just saying I I, I said it was like it was like me saying goodbye because I was never gonna ever see him again. So it was and he was I mean without a doubt he was one of the nicest guys that ever 
put on a hat and boots and spurs and chaps. He would, I'd see Lane all the time during rodeo season, and, and he was one of the guys that was always cordial. I meant when I saw Lane, he would go out of his way to come and say hi to me. So it wasn't like he was never standoffish with me. I'd, I'd see him, and right away, it was just we just had this charisma, kind of a magnetism. Hey, how are you? We shake your hand. How things been going? You know that type of stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah, it was hard. I mean, it's always hard when you see somebody that you like or whatever and they get killed, but it was really hard. Like I said, I cried like a little baby. I didn't think I'd break down like that, but I did. Yeah, he made a huge impact in the sport, you know, during his riding days and then even afterwards with all the safety changes. So, and and, and as far as you, you're concerned in your broadcasting, how do you feel you were able to contribute to the casual fans' interest in rodeo being an announcer? Well, I knew the sport, you know, inside and out, and I knew what, you know, what the fans were looking for, the little intricate things and stuff like that. So I would always give my little, you know, play-by-play or something like that. And the other thing that always helped me is I've always had an excellent memory. And so I didn't have to have a you know, there was no such thing as a laptop computer back in 1989 or things like that. So, I mean, I knew data, and I still do to this day, but I could tell you this guy was 86 points on this bill at Reno and no, 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 and I'd rattle that stuff off. When I was a kid, this guy back home, Andy Harris, used to call me Mr. Rodeo because I kept up with data. I knew stuff, and people would come to me, and I knew bulls, I knew their patterns, and and I just, I've always had a great memory for bull rides and, and statistics and things of that nature. So even so today, I still have a great memory about it. I just don't follow it as close as I used to. You know, when I became a fan of bull riding is when I was contracted to be a camera operator on, on an event in Phoenix. And I had no idea what was going on. I was the cameraman on the shoot and, you know, I was a little bit nervous. I had somebody holding me just in case I fell. You know, and I I just thought it was a bunch of crazy cowboys jumping on a bull to see if they could ride for eight seconds. But there's a lot of technique that goes into it, as I've discovered. So for someone who's learning about bull riding, what should they try and pay attention to uh, when they're either at the sport or maybe on TV? It's just like an Olympic sport. I mean, you understand, you watch control. You can tell, like, you know, some of the things that guys like judges are looking for, like if a bull jumps, kicks, spins, kicks, stuff like that, change of direction. If a guy's riding really well, you can tell if a guy is in control or if he's slipping and sliding and flopping and popping all over the place. You know, a good, solid ride. So you can tell just by watching you know, you go to enough bull riding events, or if you're just a novice, first timer, you, you you pick up on what's what's good. You know, if a guy's in trouble, you can tell when a guy gets in trouble because usually if he gets in trouble, and the very next jump he's bucking off. There's something, excuse me, there's some things you have to do correctly to stay on bulls, and and you know it's called posting and getting up, get out over the bull when he comes up in the front end, and then like. And lean back just a little bit, not too much, but, you know, throw your free arm back when he kicks. And then you have to reposition yourself, just like a, you know, like in an English event, a horse jumping over all these different obstacles. Well, it's a, a, a give and a flow. And there's, you know, bull riding's a finesse event, too. People think you have to be the strongest man in the world. No, it's finesse. You give and take. It's like with a dance partner. He, the, the bull does something, you counteract it. And that's how it works. And there, yeah, you cannot, you know, out, out strong or, you know, there's, it's not strength. You're not trying to be stronger than the bull. You're just trying to finesse and move with him and get away from his power. And so there's a lot of little scientific things that you do that are basic bull riding events. Your free arm, your head, you want to keep your, your chin tucked, look down, you want to keep contact with your knees, contact with your feet, contact with your spurs, unless you want to get a few more points and you decide to spur. But there's a lot of things, you know, people that are fans know what to look for. And the good bull riders, you like to watch them because they do everything right scientifically and that's why they're so good and they make it look so easy you know and especially some of the guys today jb Mooney, and you know all those guys it's it's incredible to watch uh, you know and again they make it look so easy 
Right. Yeah. Those, 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 you know, there's a few guys in the, the PBR that are really, really good, you know, and, uh, yeah, there's guys in the PRCA that are really, really good too. There's yeah. some talented bull riders. I'm at Sage Kennedy now. I think he's won six world titles in a row and he's in the lead to win a seventh. And then, you know, you go across the board. There's guys over in the PBR, Cooper Davis and guys like Guilherme Marchi and, yep. you know, Adriano Morais and some of those guys, too. So, yeah, there's uh, Jeff Lockwood. He's a world champion. Yep. And there's a, there's a lot of those Brazilian guys. They ride really, really well. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a, there's a really good Netflix uh, series. I'm not sure you've had the chance to see it, but it's called Fearless. For anybody listening, if you want to see what bull riding is all about, that's a really, really good documentary series, again, on, on Netflix. Now, you've authored two books, one called My Cowboy Hat Still Fits, My Life as a Rodeo Star, and you kind of referred to it earlier. So what's your book about? Well, it's all about my rodeo career. I, I worked in the financial services industry, and, and for years... You know, it was kind of fun. One day I was looking on the internet. This is when the internet first came out. And I found this story on there. It's something about black bull rider puts up with a lot of bull. And I started reading this story, and I'm like, wow. I was, I was Googling Charles Sampson. I knew there'd be stuff on there about him. Well, actually, the story was written totally about me, but it had Charles Sampson's name in there. So I got excited. Wow, I got this story on the internet. It's all about me. And I printed it. And I showed it to my coworkers, and they gave me a hard time. That's not you. <laughs> Again. You're not a bull rider. And I showed them my buckle. Well, yeah, it is. That's not you. This one lady, she just like, you Googled yourself and found this article, and now you try to play yourself off as a black bull rider. You're not a bull rider. <laughs> oh, yes. Gave me a hard time. So about four years later, my book was published. She was one of the first people to buy one. But I don't know. It was, it was, it was exciting to see my name on the internet. I don't really get too excited about it anymore because it's all over the internet. Sure. I've had, you know, I have my cookie business, my tea books. I have two websites. I'll tell you what they are right now. It's abemars.com and there's a one called cowboy shootout cookies.com. But the one site, abemars.com was actually put on there, uh, about November, 2018. So we're looking at about a year and a half and, I'm not exaggerating. It gets about 50 to 60 hits every single day without fail. Wow. There's over 25,000 hits on that site, and it goes up daily. How did you come up with the, the writing of the book? Because, I mean, that seems like a whole different discipline in itself. My coworkers at the financial services said, you have a really, really unique story. Black cowboy, rodeo announcer, TV commentator, bull rider, da 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 New Jersey. You need to sit down and write your personal story. And I hadn't really thought about it. But then this one lady, she bugged me and bugged me and bugged me and bugged me and bugged me about writing my book. And I finally got tired of her bothering me. And that's the truth. If she didn't bother me, I never wrote the book, but I got tired of her bothering me. And so finally, I just sat down one day, started writing the book, and then it you know, took me about 10 months to write it. But once I started writing it, and I would write it, and then I would print off some of it, and I would show people, and they're like, man, this is really good. Were you a journalism major? No. <laughs> they said, you're, you're an excellent writer. And that just kept, that fueled me. And I thought, man, these people like my by writing so much, so I kept going. So I wrote that, and then I started writing for this magazine called Humps and Horns Bull Riding Magazine, and I wrote for them for 12 years. I had a monthly column, and I started writing for the magazine before my book came out, and I had a column in there, and I, the title of the column was My Cowboy Hat Still Fits, same title as my book, and I had people tell me all the time. They said, I get my subscription, I get my, you know, my... I get my publication once a month. They said, the first thing I do is go read one of your, read your story. And so they told me, they said, we know you have a book. We enjoy your columns. And they said, when that book comes out, I want to be one of the first ones to get it. So I actually kept them updated. And before the book ever came out, I had checks in my hand from people who wanted copies of my book before I ever got the books. <laughs> so... Yeah, but I told them, hey, books are coming. I got your checks. It's going to be a couple weeks. As soon as I get the books, in the mail they'll go. And I'll say this, too. I've had 
at least five people tell me they read my book in one day. They said they started it, couldn't put it down, and they finished it. And one of them was a guy who worked in the post office. He bought a copy of my book, and I mean, he worked his job, and then he went home and started reading my book, and he stayed up till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and I came back in the post office the next day, and he said, I finished it. I go, no, you didn't. He goes, yes, I did. He said, I started reading. I couldn't put it down. <laughs> so I know it's a good book. I've had people tell me on a regular basis that is an excellent book and one of the best books they've ever read. Now, other than some of the things we've talked about today, is there anything else in the book that might be of interest to anyone listening? Well, I'll say this. And I, maybe I'm letting the cat out of the bag, but you know, I've had some of my closest friends tell me I need to write one more book. You know, I, the first book was my radio career. Second book was called Just the Fires Fight for a Son because I had to go through a pretty, pretty difficult divorce and custody fight. And I, you know, eventually the judge granted me custody of my son. So I wrote that book. And now they're saying with your cookie business and the stuff you've done, you need to write one more. And so I've already decided I'm going to write one more book and then I'm done. I don't want to write any more, but... That'll be it for me, but that'll be three autobiographies, but I'll talk about my rodeo career, I'll talk about what's going on in my life now, and I'll talk about my cookie career, which I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy, I'm, I'm, I'm elated that my cookie business is going as well as it is, and I get, I get repeat buyers all the time, and every time I see them, they're like, they keep telling me, these are the best cookies. Now I have, a, I have three cookies, I have chocolate chips, with pecans, Redwood chocolate chips, and I have a snickerdoodle that I do now. It's a cinnamon snickerdoodle cookie, and I put white chocolate chips in those. But people are raving over those, too. And so, I mean, right now, I want to gradually build my business to where when I, you know, when I retire from the VA, my cookie business will be my full-time job. So, I mean, at this point, sure, I'd like to get a, a partner, a business partner to help me with the business in, I can bake right now and I'm okay, but there's times I get wore out from trying to keep up with all the, and I've, I've already figured out there's no way I'm going to get big unless I get some physical help with this cookie business. So that's where I am. And one of these days I'll get an Instagram account and go from there. Well, I'm, I'm trying, I, my goal is to get that this year, get an Instagram and just kind of go from there. But I'm still, I'm very, very thankful that I never thought I would get this kind of feedback from my cookie business. So it's going to grow. And I have goals. I mean, I want to be in, I'm not going to lie to you. I hope I have a story in the Black Enterprise sometime in the next year or so. We'll see. The cookies are really, really good. So, and, and like I said before, they, they sell out quick um, at any of the events that I've seen you at. So yeah, I, I, knew you were, I knew you were filming stuff for Ty when I first met you. And that was what, 2018. So, I mean, you know, the weird thing, Don, is I, I sold out in 2018. I took extra cookies in 2019 and I sold out again. And I had people, were you there this year? I was. Okay. I had people, well, you saw the announcer announce me to the crowd and they started standing up. Yeah. Hey, 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 we up here. We want some cookies. I sold out. I felt bad because the second it was, you know, that night performance, I had about six or seven people in line waving money. Hey, hey, hey. And I sold out. I, I, I felt bad about it, but <laughs> I'm like, wow. That's when I said I did the best I could to take as many cookies as I could, and I was wore out. <laughs> so I need somebody to help me bake cookies. That's the next goal. Yeah. Uh, again, your website is Cowboy Shootout Cookies, and shoot is spelled C H U T E, like the bucking shoot. Yes. Cowboy Shootout Cookies dot com, and then Abe Morris dot com for any of the book uh, information, and just a little bit about you as well. Um, so, we're getting to the end of our time together, but there are a couple more questions for you. One: What's the best advice you've ever been given in the industry that you've been in? Let's go bull riding first, and then the riding industry. I'm going to go, uh, as far as the bull riding industry, my cousin Gene Walker, who, he's deceased now, but he always told us multiple times, I never forgot, he'd always say the safest place as far as bull riding was in the middle of their back. 
I could see that. Yep, that's what he said. Now, I guess in the writing industry, I think when I first started writing, I remember people told me, they said, you better have some thick skin because it's a very, very tough industry. And, uh, you know, I've sold a lot of books and I'm just, I'm happy with my book sales. I've sold not just the rodeo people, but people outside of the industry have bought my book and they really enjoy it. So, and I still continue to sell my books. I think I didn't know this at first, but, uh, I, you know, I found out, and I think my problem you know, somebody told me that that uh, only let me make sure I get this right. I mean, there's multiple books that are published, self-published, on, on, on. But she said every year only only seven percent of the books that are published sell more than one thousand copies in the first year. Only seven percent, and so. I mean, I sold a lot more than that in the first year. So I know my book. I'm like, wow, I sold more than a thousand copies of my book in the first year. Most of the books were sold by me. I didn't have anybody out there marketing or anything like that. I did it myself and I continue to market. I mean, I know how to sell. That's one thing I've always told people. I mean, I've been a licensed insurance agent for like 25 years now. I learned a lot in the industry. I know how to market. And I know how to sell, and that's just the carryover now from, you know, my books, my writing, and my cookie business. And I'll say this, too. I don't know if this is going to happen, but I honestly do believe that when I die, that people are going to say, the first thing come out of their mouth is going to say, oh, that's that cookie guy. Because, see, mainstream media hasn't discovered my cookies yet. The rodeo <laughs> people know about them. And I'm hoping when I cross over, and that's the thing, you know, may, most people that, you know, most people are probably not going to be interested in reading a rodeo book, but I'll guarantee you a heck of a lot of them like eating chocolate chip cookies from all walks of life. And that's where I will make my mark. It's so interesting to hear all the things that you've done. And, and I can just hear your passion when you're talking about your cookies and your book. Um, so I wish you the best of luck. The final thing that I'd like to ask from you is because you've been doing all of these things, is there any piece of advice that you would give uh, listeners on, on how to, I guess, manage multiple projects or, or be in the moment on what you're doing? I would, I would, you know, I would say, I mean, I'm lucky. I'm grateful. I'm honestly do believe I will leave a legacy behind. And I'll be honest too, even with the cookie business, I, I may never get rich off of it, but I, I honestly think I can. I think the potential is there because people like them so much. But my goal with my cookie business is not to be rich. I want to be able to leave my cookie business to my son, Justin and my family and get them incorporated and work. And I hope they get rich. So if I don't get rich, no big deal. But I've been blessed. You know, God has given me a lot of talent as far as writing, speaking, baking, marketing, and I'm going to use it all. So I, I honestly believe when I go to my grave or on my deathbed, I won't be looking back and, and having regrets. You know, my whole thing with my tricky business now, I've struggled financially, you know, multiple times, but... As long as I don't ever struggle again for the rest of my life, I will be happy. And I hope my cookies do become super, super famous and well-known all over the United States. I, that's my goal. I, I hope they are mass-produced. I hope they sound like crazy because I honestly see that happening probably within three years. You know, I've said this multiple times. They're really good. So if you haven't had the chance to try them and you do get the chance, uh, I highly recommend it. So, Abe, best of luck to you with the cookie business and the book business. And thank you for sharing a little bit about your story and, and, and how it all came together for you. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Don. I appreciate it. Okay, this was one of my more interesting episodes in getting to know Abe's experiences in rodeo. And even though I'm familiar with bull riding, preparing for this podcast was like a history lesson in finding out more about black cowboys in history and the impact they've made on the sport. So if you have the chance, you should look up some of the black bull riders like Murtis Deitman, Charlie Sampson, Ezekiel Mitchell, uh, and others just to get a sense of what they've accomplished. And if you're a chocolate chip cookie aficionado, give Abe's cowboy shootout cookies a try. The links will be in the podcast notes. 
And if you're into bull riding or you want to find out more about the sport in general, check out the film Fearless on Netflix, which follows the Brazilian riders. It's a really interesting watch and it taught me a lot about the struggles that bull riders go through. And a bit later in the year, my documentary on bull riding is set to release, so keep listening to the Sports in the Making podcast for updates. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you can catch both previous and upcoming episodes where I talk with people in the sports and sports broadcasting industry who have made an impact on how sports are viewed throughout the world. Episodes are released every other Thursday through the summer. And if you have any suggestions on what you'd like to know more about in sports, drop me a line at sportsinthemaking.com or contact me on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. And if you have any questions for me or my guests, I'd love to share them on the show. Wherever you listen to this podcast, I'd appreciate it if you like it, share it, and leave positive reviews on your social media channels. Also, be sure to subscribe to Sports in the Making so you don't miss out on more episodes and you can catch up on previous ones there as well. I'm your host, Don Cardona. Thank you for listening to Sports in the Making.